Okay, so um, if you can give us a bit of a background, particularly obviously for those not so familiar with you, IPC Systems, a bit about the company, you know, where it came from and, and the sort of things it does. Sure. Um, IPC has been in the industry um, for over 40 years. We specifically focus on financial markets and we have uh, an extensive array of portfolios and products that we provide to financial market customers. Um, we have two product sets in essence. One is focused on the network, uh, which is network connectivity for both voice and data products. But we also have a communications uh, product portfolio as well, which is on the Unigy platform. So you guys might be um, familiar with dealer boards you'll see on, on trading floors. So IPC is the market leader in, in dealer boards in uh, financial markets, and that platform's called Unigy. So with the uh, products that we've built over the last 40 years, we've now been able to create a synergy based on the technologies that we have within IPC, which um, creates the Unigy platform, uh, it creates a significant value prop for our customers with the Unigy platform being able to um, be deployed across our, our network. So uh, uh, just to give you a bit more context on our network, our network is, is a very, um, very highly meshed ecosystem. So we, we have voice customers on our network, we have data customers on our network, and we also have voice and data customers on our network. And you, what I mean by that is we could have a, um, a Unigy customer, a big sales side talking to a buyer side, both on Unigy, um, talking across our voice network. But they may also take market feeds from uh, uh, venues which comes across our data network, which is the same ecosystem. But we've also got other um, non-voice trading algo engine type customers that come onto our network and consume um, access to our algo engines or HFT locations um, without any uh, relevance to voice. So the, the idea and that's sort of what I'm trying to highlight here is the ecosystem isn't specifically for one addressable market. We have a very extensible portfolio that supports all the financial markets requirements. Okay, so you talked a little bit in particular about the, the, I guess, the network services, but you also do cloud connectivity solutions and I think under uh, the title of the Connexus Cloud. So can, can you give us a bit of background on that and how it fits in the portfolio? Sure. Um, so Connexus, from a branding perspective, is the uh, umbrella product portfolio for the network and, and Unigy on, on the communication side. So Connexus Cloud has um, uh, an extensive array of, of functions within it. So we do anything from layer one up to layer three on network connectivity. And over the last three years, we've been working on implementing an SDN platform to allow cloud connectivity. So we had a lot of our customers coming to us for direct access to some of the usual suspects, GCP, Azure, um, AWS, where they were, they were going on to a data centerless uh, type strategy. Where they were moving their back rooms into a subscription based cloud model. And they wanted to come to IPC to get the private network connectivity, which then gives them um, an SLA. So if you have a, um, a function that's based on a server that sits in your data center, you know that the data center connects to your front room through your network and your network team manages that. When customers move that to a subscription-based model, they're then dependent on the platforms from a, an SLA perspective. So what IPC provide is that guaranteed network SLA, SLA of linking the customer's front room users to a public cloud subscription service across our private network. So we um, originally went through partnerships with Megapore and uh, Equinix Cloud Exchange, and it gives us diversity of linking um, financial market subscription users to public clouds. So as well as being diverse inherently within the Connexus network, where we're carrier agnostic, we can pick uh, different routes across the network, across different carriers and, and providers. We've also taken a strategy for our cloud to be diverse as well. So as well as being able to go direct to AWS, we also go through cloud ag aggregation platforms like ECX and, and Megaport, which gives our customers diversity with regards to pop locations and also the, the cloud aggregation platforms. So the point being is we've always built our network on being net, um, provider agnostic and going into the clouds, we need to ensure that we provide our customers with diversity. So if Equinix had a failure in LD4, LD5, we would also then be able to leverage the same point of presence for Megaport or any other uh, cloud ag aggregation platform. And where required, if it's 100 gig type bandwidth, we can um, go direct to the public clouds as well. So that, that whole value prop on connectivity is what we built our SDN platform around. So under the Connexus Cloud um, umbrella is a product called Connexus Hub. And Connexus Hub is a cross-connect platform, which we've also built in the ability to provision into a customer's VPC. So from, from an IPC perspective, the customer is who we're providing the service to, not the cloud provider, if that makes sense. So 
where we've got, um, we could have a market data application provider um, who is hosting their backend system in AWS, but their customers may have a commercial model with Azure or GCP or, or IBM or, or a private cloud. So when you think about the users and their backend instances being able to access the applications backend system, it is VPC to VPC type connectivity that we're focusing on. So from, from our perspective on IPC, we look at provisioning the software defined network capabilities that links the provider's VPC to the customer's VPC, a real irrelevant or cloud platform. And we've got that with the Connexus Hub, which allows our customers to log into the IPC portal and uh, provision a service across our private network that links the uh, network connection app to their last mile connection to their customer site into the Connexus Hub platform. They can do cross connects to Algo engines or any other data counterparty they want. But on the same port, consolidating that access for them, they can then peel off 100 meg, one gig type connectivity into any of the public clouds. And that's all through an, an automated SDN platform where the customers get um, displayed the real time latency across our, our network infrastructure. Does that answer okay. the question? Yeah, I think it does. Yes, thanks. But um, in terms of the the sort of take up of that, because obviously the financial services sector, I guess, is well, has been notoriously reluctant maybe to you know sort of use third party cloud and stuff. But I'm also wondering with the pandemic, which has obviously forced a lot of people to work remotely, whether you know in more local offices or at home, uh, how what have you noticed, I guess, in terms of you know customer interactions around your services and, and, and that sort of remote access requirement? So before the pandemic, there was significant um, customer requirements for going to the cloud. I mean, b before we were in the situation we are now, there was a, a significant cost saving uh, directive for within our customer base. A lot of the tier one sales sides were trying to consolidate costs with regards to infrastructure based on the technologies that they're able to have now. So 10 years ago, trading platforms and um, voice, and trade, voice and data trading platforms or even the infrastructure to manage a, a, a trading floor all had to be located in the same building. So now that they're going to a more of a subscription model, the cost savings of going to a public cloud have been a lot more relevant to our, our customer base. So we have had um, RFPs, RFIs, customer requests to move large bandwidth projects onto public clouds. The pandemic has just expedited that. So from regards to a remote access perspective, just on, on the network side, we've had to provision a lot more uh, network connectivity into public clouds and also into different customer locations in a much more timely fashion. So we've had customers who have needed to bring on BCP sites overnight and our teams, our network services teams have worked um, very hard with our customer base to deliver those within a very short time scale, just to ensure that our customers are not impacted, can still trade and their end users themselves are still supported. Um, but going back to the cloud question specifically, the pandemic is, has definitely changed the perception of remote working. So whereas before the subscription based on being data centerless was just cutting costs, but now with the pandemic being data centerless and being on the public cloud definitely gives our customers a, um, an extensive array of services to connect into their, their required backend systems. But they're still dependent on, SL, on an SLA. So being able to link that um, backend system hosted in the public cloud with all of the remote access and better monitoring capabilities for the, our customers, they need that SLA because they're all working from home now. The comms teams, the network teams that support our customers end users, these are the guys that then have to log onto a screen and make sure that their services are up and running. So the, the transparency around remote working, we see as probably more key than the, um, the actual network connectivity into them because we can do the network now but the value, the differentiator that we provide is the transparency on being able to table the services up into what cloud and then being able to provision it instantly into another location. And do you get any um, sort of idea of the, particularly obviously these customers that are changing their approach because of the, the, the current circumstances? Do you get any idea as yet as to whether this is a temporary measure and they'll ha you know, breathe a huge sigh of relief? at some stage and all head back to the office and carry on as they were 12, 18 months ago? Or do you think they are beginning to realise some benefits of, of what's going on and therefore it's a, it's a long-term change potentially? Um, the current perception is it's definitely a long-term change, but I, I don't think it will be a permanently working from home type environment. I think the flexibility that our customers end users need 
Um, by example, a lot of the, the tier one customers for IPC that have moved trading rooms to off-floor locations. So people who are um, front office users, very uh, large activity uh, voice traders who, who are now working completely remote, but they, they work as a, as a team. So being remote has, has made sure that they can, they can still function during lockdown, but I don't think that their performance is at the same levels that they would be in, in a trading floor location. But from a customer perspective, I think they're definitely starting to realize the technical benefits and also the cost savings of being able to move their trading floors staff and the front office users into different locations. So we see more of a hybrid solution at post pandemic where we're gonna have a customer who, who's benefited from a lot of flexibility during the pandemic, but then is able to customize the solutions long-term to increase their, their efficiency of their, their, their users and the performance of their business. Okay, I'm moving on to another technology area, which has been around for a little while. It seemed to have initial impetus and then it's gone quiet, but maybe that's just because I haven't read the, you know, the right articles, but blockchain, um, it promises a lot. I'm just intrigued, um, A, as to what you as a company may or may not be doing with it um, in terms of using it, I know for security aspects or whatever, and also are you aware of any, you know, clearly without naming them, but any customers of yours that are asking or using that technology, um, yeah, in, in the trading environments? Yes, yeah, so we're aware of customers using the technology in trading environments, but from, from an IPC perspective, we're not a data provider as such, we're, we're more of a communications platform. So blockchain in our products and services doesn't have a definitive use case. There's no real value for IPC to go out there and say, oh, our Unity platform now supports blockchain or our network services orders are done through a blockchain. We're not addressing a network or an industry problem. We just, we do blockchain because it, it would relate to an IPC requirement. But from blockchain within financial markets, we, we've been working with R3. We have a partnership with R3. We have um, a couple of projects that we have in production now, which are going out across our network. So Connexus is supporting um, uh, blockchain, but from a, from a community perspective rather than a technology perspective. We're not integrating R3's Corda platform into Connexus from a, uh, an application perspective. What we are doing is giving R3 the ability to access financial market customers instantly, which negates blockchain providers building out a global MPLS network or building out a customer delivery network, which isn't necessarily their forte and would cost them millions, if not billions, in trying to build out their infrastructure globally. So where IPC fit within a blockchain ecosystem is more giving access to the blockchain providers, giving them the ability to access an SDN platform so that we can publish APIs to these blockchain providers so that when they bring their customer on board, whether it's deployed in a, a public cloud, so the, the, the Corda node hosting the blockchain application is spun up in an AWS backend, or if it's even in a public, uh, private cloud, IPC can support the node hosting for a, a blockchain application with an, an SLA. And again, it, the value of IPC in this, this, um, these type of projects is the services that we provide. So if you had a tier one sales side that says, I, I'd like my blockchain backend nodes in a data center I can qualify that's ISO compliant and is 200 kilometers apart, as in London or Frankfurt, this is where the services of IPC come in. So we host the, the backend infrastructure up to the operating level, and then we provide the layer three network connectivity out to the customer base. And that's no, nothing to do with blockchain, but the, the problem that we address there for blockchain applications is the blockchain provider comes in and just drop their software on top. They don't have to worry about the whole infrastructure management, network management, customer onboarding, vendor approval, billing uh, approval, all of that type of pain points, which would increase the time to market for a blockchain provider. IPC manage that as part of the service that we we do for our customers and also our providers. Okay, and do, I mean, do you have any, is blockchain, is it gonna be as big as people predict? Do you have any thoughts on that at all? Is it, I, what activity you're seeing or is it a bit overhyped or what? Uh, no, I don't think it's been overhyped. I think there's, I mean, like with any new technology, there's a lot of use cases that could relate to how it could be deployed, how it could be integrated. The vali val validity of the uh, specific project is based on how the blockchain is being used. Using, again, R3, it's been specifically designed to do a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transaction. So when you think about the trading environment, it's very much succinct with that type of use case. And when you think of how um, other blockchain technologies have been applied, 
you could do blockchain with a database. What blockchain gives you is the non-repudiation of a transaction that sits within that database. So if you, from a technology perspective, you could simple it down and just manage all of this within a database, but the blockchain gives you that 100% transparency on your, your, um, your transactions. And that is a key requirement in financial markets. And I think the more people, um, the more providers that start to understand the value of a uh, quarter type business network and how that is enabling their application to give their customers better transparency on their trading and also simplifying the workflows. So where you look at um, high value bond trades and the work that goes into settling them and clearing the, that bond trade can be simplified through a blockchain much better. You wouldn't have the amount of back office interactions, the back of manual processes, when you've got transparency on the transaction on the blockchain application, you can simplify the workflow, which the whole transaction is then put through a, a blockchain application. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. And I mean, if we, we call blockchain, I, I suppose, uh, one of the parts of the wider sort of artificial intelligence picture, um, clearly the, uh, the finance industry, I guess, with all the algorithms we, we know, and the, you know, the trading stuff like that is a, is a big user of it. But are you noticing the industry using more and more AI in, in other parts of the business. And uh, again, as, as with blockchain yourselves, are you using artificial intelligence, machine learning in any ways to add value, I guess, to, to what you're already doing? So we, we've partnerships, we've partnered with um, uh, other providers that use AI and, and ML type technologies. For IPC within our product set now, we're still evaluating whether there is a, an ability for us to leverage the capabilities of AI and ML around taking the metadata generated by our, our Unity platform or by our or that traverses our network through a, um, a partnership with a provider to then add value to our end users. Um, we do see um, AI as being a critical point of being able to provide proactive notifications on industry trends. So if you look at the, the information that traverses our, our network and traverses our trading platform Unity, you can see that we have access to which customer talks to which counterparty, which asset class is more busy in certain relevance, uh, certain times of the day. Being able to capture the traffic of a financial market ecosystem like Connexus gives us the ability to provide metrics to our users around market trends. So what we are looking at doing is capturing um, trading activity, not the trades itself, just the activity that traverses the IPC ecosystem, and then providing back to our, our users to say, hey, last week you were doing this at this time, and then trying to notice the trends. So if we can give them um, trending of the asset classes on a, on a global basis, then we're actually providing them with forecast capabilities to see how busy the networks would be or the industry would be depending on certain times of the day. So where we want to use AI is more to provide benefits to our customers to come to IPC and see how the market is evolving and how the market is, is acting, not necessarily how we can provide another AI engine. I don't see IPC going out and building an AI platform or an ML platform to, to provide trading applications. There's no real value and we would be competing with our, our existing providers. I see IPC going out to the marketplace and finding opportunities to leverage AI and ML type technologies to benefit existing products and services and new partnerships that IPC make with the uh, participants in the industry. Okay, and just um, perhaps going back to the, the cloud managed services piece for a minute, uh, you, you've sort of highlighted that the financial service industry is more accepting of those technologies now. Do you have any thoughts or ideas as to how far, I mean, traditionally people have said, you know, they can use it for a lot of non-essential or when it's mission critical, you know, the trading app or whatever it is, you know, the one app that runs the business, they might forever be reluctant to, you know, give that to a third party. Do you think that will always be the case or are you beginning to see or think that maybe they are trusting of cloud amount of services and therefore at some stage you may well, uh, you know, give all their assets um, you know, to outsourced IT? I think the, uh, to your point, I think the industry is starting to get more confidence into outsourcing. I think if you look at where the public clouds came into financial markets 10, 15 years ago, and they started to talk about outsourcing data centers, turning off back rooms, there was a lot of reluctance because it's a new way of thinking, right? So you, you've got a comms manager or a network guy that's managing their infrastructure within their data center. So you tier one sell side, backroom, data centers all over the world. There's a guy that can provide metrics to his boss and to his, his users 
to say, if you, the application's here, I can manage it because I've, I've got complete oversight. What we definitely see more of is the transparency. What we see is the customers needing to know that the SLA associated to outsourcing something is still going to be as good as being managed by their internal teams. And, it, and, and it's back to the confidence that people will push more to outsourcing if they can trust it more. And trust needs uh, transparency. So if you're able to see the metrics associated to the connections to the outsource provider, whether it's public cloud, private cloud, whatever, they need to be able to trust that by being able to query it the same way they would do if they went to their, their IT teams or their network teams or their comms teams. That's the type of um, uh, level of confidence that customers are starting to get. And I think that you will find most of and the pandemic was the, the true um, use case, right? So back at the beginning of last year when people were told that they had to work from home, all the BC, BCP planning that they'd had for decades actually got put into action. And whether it was planned correctly or whether it wasn't, it actually tested the network team's ability to use outsourcing at a very high level. I mean, you've, you've got all of your users all demanding to get access back to the, the trading applications today. And you only built a BCP plan, say, for 10 or 50 users, but you've had to invoke it for everyone. That has definitely given the industry a huge amount of confidence in being able to outsource and also see the, the abilities and the enhanced user experience of outsourcing to um, public clouds or even hybrid clouds. And that, that's, that's another angle where we see the, the long term. Back to your previous question, we definitely see more of a hybrid cloud solution moving forwards. I think a lot of the tier one uh, customers for IPC are very sensitive around where their data is kept. So ensuring that their compute nodes associated to any application is in a qualifiable um, location means that they can, and is ISO compliant, and their compliance teams can tick off on that service being outsourced, having the SLA to then access that back to their front rooms, but also then leveraging public cloud. So where you've got compute nodes in uh, with sensitive data in dedicated data centers on a network with an SLA back to the front office, but data at rest doesn't necessarily need to take the same compute resources. Data at rest can be pushed into the customer's VPC in the, in the public cloud. So I think where IPC is seeing the industry move over the next year or two is more adoption of hybrid cloud, which is the synergy of the, the security and compliance of private with the extensive capabilities of public. Okay, and, and before we finish, I mean, are there one or two final thoughts you've got, as, you know, if people are looking at the technology that you're offering or, you know, the solutions out there for, for their the problems they might have one or two pieces of advice as to what what they need to look out for you know as they're evaluating solutions um so from from my perspective the 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 main function would be uh, transparency sla i mean if you are looking to move your products into a managed service public cloud hybrid cloud type model it's what are the capabilities of the provider to support your your um, analytical data and you're going to log in in the morning you're going to be working from home how do you evaluate what platform you migrate to from your existing back office infrastructure managed in your data centers? It's gonna be around uh, support. It's gonna be around transparency on, on the data. And it's gonna be around how you can proactively manage your estate in the same fashion you do today, but when the back end's been managed by someone else. So the technologies that, we're, that are being applied to that, um, uh, to technologies like uh, Kubernetes, so you look at the impact that Kubernetes has had in the industry from a deployment perspective. This is how, based on confidence, people are going to be applying technologies like that to manage the, all of their infrastructure. So a Kubernetes as a service type model where they can spin up infrastructure on demand, the same way they do in public clouds, is where we can see more transparency around the instances being spun up, the access to those instances, and the application scalability from uh, being supported on those type of technologies. So I, I definitely see the questions that would be relevant to understanding how you adopt new technologies is more around the transparency of it. If you can manage this the same way you would have done it in-house, then there's no reason why you can't outsource it. And ju just to that point, is it possible as well, because there's one thing, you know, you, obviously people can talk through their solutions, all the things they can do, but clearly the proof is in the, in the pudding. So in terms of actually try, you know, testing, is it possible to test, you know, with companies like yourself before fully committing, you know, to a particular way forward or or is yeah. that not so easy to do yeah it is i mean uh, i i run the connexus labs initiative we started this uh two and a half years ago um, and connexus labs was basically a sandbox that was a um 
a replication of all of our production services in an LD4 data center. So it's the perfect example of a hybrid cloud. And, and the uh, premise of this is, is exactly to your point, is to support customers try new technologies without having to go out and build new infrastructure, subs uh, subscribe to 12 month long contracts to then get the connectivity in to actually replicate a new technology. We sponsor uh, the projects in Connexus Labs to allow our customers to come in, try an integration with a, a Unigy or a network service, or what we've done with the blockchain application is we've supported the provider in Connexus Labs to build their core app and then also go to market with it. So when you, you talk about product lifecycle, well, the problem we've addressed with Connexus Labs is we've given the ability to a provider to build the application, test the application, beta trial the application, and then move that onto a production environment all through a, um, a Kubernetes type of platform. So it's giving the customers the ability to trial their products to the addressable market without the requirement for them to build out massive amounts of infrastructure. That also allows them to consume newer technologies that we have in public clouds. So linking that hybrid cloud model through Connexus Labs is where we would promote more um, projects with our customer base. But you, to your point, if you don't allow people to try it, you're never going to really drive customer adoption of new technologies. So Connexus Labs isn't a, a revenue data generator for IPC. It's, it's a technology enabler. It's that sandbox environment where we can go to our customers and say, have you looked at transcription for your voice services? Have you looked at AI for your metadata? Have you looked at the services that, and the metadata that you have through your IPC products? Well, we can put that all into Connexus Labs for you and we can work with your provider application to give them access to that, whether that's remote via VPNs or SSH tunnels, but you've got this metadata. This is your IPC world and you, you have access to this metadata and we can work with the customers within Connexus Labs to see how the metadata can be used for their products and services or even their providers. I mean, there are instances where we'll have customers come to us and they've, they've got a requirement for a new product and they wanna work with someone else as a provider, but they need IPC to support the application and host it so they can build it. And that's the whole premise of Connexus Labs is just to give people that launch pad for new products and technologies just to evaluate them. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We just turn it off and we use the infrastructure. But if it does work, Connexus gives us the, the customer and the provider the launch pad to go to market in a, um, an instant fashion. That's brilliant. I've, I've really enjoyed chatting to you, Rob. So um, appreciate your time. Thanks very much. No problem at all. It's good to talk to you today. Have a good day.